Hey guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. If everyone can just take their seats, feel free to just keep getting food in the back. Thank you all for coming to our, our final night in this winter series um, entitled Reclaiming Art. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. So we have our um, St. Thomas Aquinas is our um, patron of this series. So we have this prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas that we're going to get started with. So, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Grant me, O Lord my God, a mind to know you, a heart to seek you, wisdom to find you, conduct pleasing to you, faithful perseverance in waiting for you, and a hope of finally embracing you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so our series theme for this winter series is Reclaiming Goodness, Truth, and Beauty. And tonight's topic is Reclaiming Art. And for our, for our speaking tonight, we have Stephen Brainy. Uh, we welcome Stephen. Stephen uh, is a grad of Notre Dame. He's a creative and a native of South Bend. Um, he has a BA in both philosophy and industrial design, as well as a Master's of Divinity from Notre Dame. Um, Stephen recently, most recently worked at the McGrath Institute on campus in Notre Dame and worked uh, in design and um, marketing production and is currently a freelance illustrator and is working on tackling his next step, which is pursuing an MFA. And uh, we welcome Stephen Brainy. Should I just put this in there? Okay, thank you, Gabe, for that kind introduction. Um, thanks also to Sean and the whole Theology on Tap team um, for setting up this evening. And then, of course, thank you to you all for coming. Um, it means a lot that you're here. And um, I also think it means a lot that you're here to support the arts in the church and um, to acknowledge that this is sort of an important topic for you to learn about. Um, I also want to acknowledge before we start all of the artists and designers who um, contributed their artwork and their designs this evening. Um, it takes quite a bit of effort to put these things together and also um, no small amount of courage to be willing to display them in this way. Um, so please join me in thanking our artists and our designers. So tonight I am going to be tackling the topic of beauty and art. Um, and I must admit this gives me some excitement but also some trepidation um, excitement because um, art is a significant part of my own life and interests and also my own vocational journey. Um, but also some trepidation because when we venture into this space of, of art and beauty, it gets kind of foggy kind of fast. And um, it's sort of contradictory because, you know, we have these things that are, these experiences of, is a, of art or these experiences of beauty that are very physical and very concrete, and we can see them and experience them. Um, but suddenly, when we start to talk about them, um, we, we, we move into this world of, of abstract language and this sort of ambiguity and mystery and multivalence. Um, so I feel that a little bit in trying to speak to you tonight um, on these topics. So I think I'm going to provide for you... Um, some of the things that have helped me explore these topics, but I don't know that I'm necessarily going to provide you um, with any answers per se. So to that end, um, the two things I'm going to cover tonight, we're actually going to split this up into two parts. So in the beginning, I'm going to cover beauty, or more specifically, I'm going to address the topic or the phrase, the common phrase, beauty will save the world. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll break up into our tables and talk for a little bit. And then for the second part, I'll talk more about art itself. Um, and then again, we'll have some time to talk about those things. Um, another thing I want to name that I realized uh, as I read over my talk this afternoon, what I'm about to say about beauty might sound a little bit like I'm like attacking beauty. I'm not attacking beauty. Um, I'm just really concerned about this phrase, beauty will save the world. And I hope that that's clear. And I hope that... Um, you trust me when I say that I love beauty, and beauty is a good thing. <laughs> so I begin with this. Well, first of all, how many people here have heard the phrase, except for me just saying it now, have heard the phrase, beauty will save the world? Okay, sweet. That makes me feel great. Um, I start here because this phrase has become something of like the motto or the rallying cry for 
um, Catholic artists and designers and creative people um, within the church. And I can understand why. It's short. It's memorable. It's kind of mysterious. It like fits the artist vibe. It gets people pumped up. It gives us a direction. It gives us distinction. It feels good. Like beauty will save the world. And I'm like, yeah. But the phrase also really, really scares me. And here's why. Beauty is ambiguous. Or at least as we encounter it in this world, beauty is ambiguous and not an end in itself. So thus taken casually, this phrase, beauty will save the world, risks confusion at like a base level. It certainly risks some pride among the people who are pursuing it. Um, And it actually risks a kind of accidental or unthinking idolatry. So before I get too deep into unpacking beauty will save the world and what I think this phrase means, um, I just want to acknowledge where it came from. So this phrase comes from a book called The Idiot. It's a novel written by Fyodor Dostoevsky, a Russian novelist. And it's actually not really even a statement in the book. It's posed as a question by a man of questionable sanity. This man asks, Ippolit asks, Is it true, Prince, that you said once that beauty would save the world? What sort of beauty will save the world? And Prince Mishkin, the title character, the idiot, looks at him attentively and makes no answer. So that's it. That is where this phrase comes from. <laughs> I don't know why it's gathered so much steam, perhaps because it also participates in this, like, it's just a beautiful rendering But there are also two other quotes I want to bring up from this book, The Idiot. Um, I'll just share those with you. So at another point in the book, Prince Mishkin, again the title character, says, It's difficult to judge beauty. Beauty is a riddle. And a few pages later, a woman who's in his presence, she's looking at a photo of another woman who is very beautiful. She looks at it and she says, What power? Such beauty is power. With beauty like that, one might turn the world upside down. So I bring these up, not necessarily to dispute what Dostoevsky says or thinks about beauty, but to, at the very least, add some complexity and nuance to the idea that beauty will save the world is somehow a phrase or a belief of Dostoevsky himself. Taken in total, we see that he has said, will beauty save the world? Beauty is a riddle, and beauty is so powerful that it could turn the world upside down. So take that for what it is. Now there is one way, which I think is perhaps obvious, that we could interpret the phrase, beauty will save the world, that kind of clears us um, of any of these difficulties that I named earlier. We could say, well, when I say beauty will save the world, what I really mean is that beauty is an attribute of God or another name for God. So when I say beauty will save the world, what I really mean is beauty, God, will save the world. And I don't think that's an unfair interpretation. The trouble is that when we artists tend to throw this phrase around, we justify it in these metaphysical terms, but then we very quickly apply it to individual terms. So the assumption, especially among Catholic artists, goes something like this. As long as I'm pursuing beauty, as long as I'm making something beautiful, then I'm serving God, because God is beauty and beauty will save the world. And again, that sounds really good, and it sounds really freeing for a Catholic artist, musician, writer. But it's dangerous. Because on this side of eternity, in this fallen world as we know it, beauty is commingled with matter and our lives in such a way that an experience or a witness of beauty is not always a sure path to God. I think there are a number of examples we could find, but stuff that came to mind for me, I was thinking about the Super Bowl and the commercials, and there was a Super Bowl commercial, I don't know if you guys saw it, 
Um, it was about the four loves. And man, that was a beautiful commercial. And it starts off as this montage about the four loves, and they have this beautiful cinematography. And while this commercial is going on, I'm, I'm like thinking to myself, please be about the church, please be about L'Arche, I don't care, just please be about something good. And then it comes to the end of this beautiful, beautiful commercial, and it's something like, for the last 75 years, New York Life Insurance has been helping you love. I'm like, oh, oh, come on. And it was so beautiful. And then I also thought, I did not watch the halftime show, but I do know that Shakira and J-Lo um, were the stars of the halftime show. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who would not say that Shakira and J-Lo are beautiful women. But I also, again, I didn't see it, but I'm also pretty sure that whatever the presentation was, whatever their performance was, um, however beautiful and dazzling, was probably not leading people to God. So there is a kind of a second tier now. So I sort of said, at the highest level we could sort of use beauty will save the world as just another way of saying God will save the world. There is kind of an intermediate interpretation, um, which is sort of beauty as this kind of like golden lifeline that gets thrown out there and that maybe wakes people up or it's a way to be pulled out of the distractions of the world and drawn to something higher. And this is actually the interpretation that John Paul II invokes in his letter to, to artists in 1999. And then something similar that Pope Benedict XVI invokes um, in an address to artists that came out 10 years, on the 10 year anniversary of JP2's letter to artists. So I'm gonna to touch on those briefly um, to show you what maybe this um, intermediate interpretation of beauty will save the world could look like. So at the beginning of his letter to artists, John Paul II quotes a Polish poet named Cyprian Norvid. And he writes, Beauty is to enthuse us for work, and work is to raise us up. That's from Cyprian Norvid. And then later, JP2 says, People of today and tomorrow need this enthusiasm, the enthusiasm inspired by beauty. If they are to meet and master the crucial, crucial challenges which stand before us, Thanks to this enthusiasm inspired by beauty, humanity, every time it loses its way, will be able to lift itself up and set out again on the right path. In this sense, it has been said with profound insight that beauty will save the world. So you can see JP2 is thinking of it as this thing that humanity can use to say, whoa, what's going on? We're in a weird spot. Let's lift ourselves out of this and point ourselves to something greater. And 10 years later, I think Pope Benedict actually takes this to a finer point. And he looks at the role of beauty almost in the same way that like that shocking character or that shocking turn in a Flannery O'Connor um, short story appears. Here's what Pope Benedict said. Indeed, an essential function of genuine beauty is that it gives man a healthy shock. It draws him out of himself wrenches him away from resignation and from being content with the humdrum. It even makes him suffer, piercing him like a dart. But in so doing, it reawakens him, opening afresh the eyes of his heart and mind, giving him wings to carry him aloft. But Benedict also goes somewhere that JP2 <clears throat> didn't go. Benedict points out clearly for us the other side of the coin, the other side of the ambiguity of beauty. Benedict XVI goes on to add, too often though, the beauty that is thrust upon us is illusory and deceitful, superficial and blinding, leaving the onlooker dazed. Instead of bringing him out of himself and opening him up to horizons of true freedom, this sort of beauty imprisons him within himself and further enslaves him, depriving him of hope and joy. It is a seductive but hypocritical beauty that rekindles desire, the will to power, to possess, and to dominate others. It is a beauty which, which soon turns into its opposite, 
taking on the guise of indecency, transgression, or gratuitous provocation. So I think here, Benedict has laid out for us the great potential of this thing that is beauty, of this gift that is beauty, but also the ways in which it can lead us to things that are not good for our, for our health. And so it is in this sense that I propose to you that this saying, beauty will save the world, is perhaps more dangerous than helpful, or at least if used carelessly. But I do want to push the point actually a little bit further. And I want to talk um, a little bit about scripture briefly, and then what I'm going to propose a different Dostoevsky quote that actually might be more helpful. So I do want you to recall that the name Lucifer means light bearer. And remind you that the father of lies will shun no disguise in order to lead us astray. This is from the prophet Isaiah. How did you come to fall from the heavens, Lucifer? You that rose in the morning full of beauty. You that fell down to the earth. From the prophet Ezekiel. Your heart was puffed up with pride because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom owing to your splendor. Consider, too, that the fruit in the garden had three characteristics. It was good to eat, it was pleasing to the eye, and it was desirable. That sounds quite beautiful to me. Also recall that it was David who, when seeing the beauty of Bathsheba, decided to take her as his own, and as a result, have her husband murdered. I'm sure there are other examples of this in Scripture, and I think we could probably think of instances in our own lives or in history um, where this has been true as well. So, okay, now what? I've taken this phrase, and I've... (laughs) Great, good job. I do think there's another possibility. Again, this is offered by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This comes from a different novel. This novel is The Brothers Karamazov. And this line comes from Dmitri. Dmitri says, Beauty is as mysterious as it is terrible. God and the devil are fighting there, and the battlefield is the human heart. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. If Catholic artists were going to adopt as a motto a line about beauty from Dostoevsky, I wish it were this one or something like it. A view that acknowledges the power of beauty and also its ability to cut both ways. A view that takes up the arts and wields them, not to protect or save or just preserve beauty, but to save the human heart, which is so attached to beauty. I do believe that artists have a certain privileged position in the spiritual battle for the human heart for this reason. And I do also believe that this battle includes culture, style, material, art, all of the different ways that we communicate. And I believe that the artist can engage these to participate in this duel with the devil. But we should keep in mind that the prize of this battle is my heart and yours, and the heart of every human person. And so we have this question or this thought, beauty will save the world. I would like to propose that when it comes to the question of beauty then, my allegiance, and I hope yours too, is not with a common notion of being called beauty, but with a person, Jesus Christ, the one who saves. Uh, So in this next little bit, like I said, I'm going to talk about art. And the topic for tonight was reclaiming art. I think I get, I don't know, I think I'm going to take a a different approach to art than maybe you might expect. Um, So maybe this came up in your discussion at your table, the question of like, so why did he spend all that time talking about a quote from a Russian novel And the reason, as I kind of mentioned, is that this saying, beauty will save the world, comes up a lot in these Catholic circles of artists. But another reason is that I actually see the 
unquestioned persistence and valuation of this phrase um, as an obstacle to um, the church pursuing and taking on a deeper approach to art and reclaiming it in a different sort of way. So hopefully having um, detached or pruned back some of the brambles of beauty, um, I'm going to share with you the catechism's definition of art, and then I'm going to connect that to the charisms and the vocation of us all to be saints. So the catechism defines art in this way. It says, beyond the the search for the necessities of life, which is common to all living things, art is a freely given superabundance of the human being's inner riches. Art is not an absolute end in itself, but is ordered to and ennobled by the ultimate end of man. So the core of that, art is a freely given superabundance of the human being's inner riches. There are three things I really want to highlight from this definition. The first is that art is a free gift that's given so that it can be freely given in return. Excuse me, a a gift that's freely received so that it can be freely given in return. Second is that art flows, or maybe even more accurately, overflows from an abundance of a person's inner riches. And third, art is an end, not in itself, but does indeed order us towards our true end, namely God. So taking these in order, the idea of a free gift Um, A couple weeks ago, I think Sean actually hosted another called and gifted workshop. And did you? Yeah, okay, good, okay. (laughs) Uh, This is, the called and gifted workshop is a method of discerning, developing, um, and using one's spiritual gifts, which are called charisms. So, back to the catechism. Here's what the catechism says about charisms. Whether extraordinary or simple and humble, Charisms are graces of the Holy Spirit which directly or indirectly benefit the church, ordered as they are to her building up the good of men and the needs of the world. And I bring up charisms because I think they fit so well with the catechism's definition of art. A charism, first of all, is a gift received from the Holy Spirit. And we receive this gift not as a benefit to ourselves, but as a gift to be freely given to others. And that's why the Catechism points out that the charisms are ordered towards the building up of the church, the good of people, and the needs of the world. Second, as a gift of the Holy Spirit, charisms are an inner richness that when received and cultivated overflows as a superabundance to be given away to others. And finally, although the charisms are goods in and of themselves, they are in fact still ordered to and ennobled by the ultimate end of man. That sounds awfully familiar to the definition of art. And perhaps you can already see where I'm heading with this. What I'd love to do is to expand our conception of art beyond the traditional categories that one might name or that one might see at an art museum, painting, sculpture, drawing, music, writing, dance. And I want to open up the possibility that God's imagination, even in terms of art, is bigger than ours. That God's creativity knows no bounds. And that God wishes to bless the church and the world through the unique combination of gifts that he has given to each one of us. So it's true, artists in the traditional sense have specific kinds of charisms. Craftsmanship, writing, music, we would probably name them. But there are so many more distinct calls to be holy. To become saints, to build up the kingdom of God through the artistry of your lives. And lest you think that's just a little poetic turn of phrase. 
Coming again from John Paul II's letter to artists in 1999, John Paul II spends the whole second section of that letter relating art to the call to holiness. He begins, Not all are called to be artists in the specific sense of the term. Yet, as Genesis has it, all men and women are entrusted with the task of crafting their own life. In a certain sense, they are to make of it a work of art, a masterpiece. Consider also this passage from Jacques Maritain's Art and Scholasticism. We talk of Christian art or the art of a Christian as we talk of the art of a bee or the art of a man. It is the art of humanity redeemed. It is implanted in the Christian soul by the side of the running waters, under the sky of the theological virtues, amid the breaths of the seven gifts of the Spirit. It is natural for it to bear Christian fruit. Everything sacred or profane belongs to Christian art. It is at home in the whole range of man's industry and joy. I had to quote these because... I, I didn't think there was a, a better or clearer way to say it or express it. And what I'm proposing is that the surest way for all of us in this room, whether we have the traditional artist skills and talents or charisms or not, the surest way for us to become artists is to make of our lives a work of art, to freely give of our superabundance of inner riches, this is precisely, for each of us, whatever our charisms are, to embrace those, to receive those, to cultivate those, and then give them away. There are any number of charisms, perhaps even an infinite number, because the Holy Spirit gifts each of us in a unique way. However, a certain number of them have recurred with enough frequency throughout the history of the church that we've been able to sort of like name and identify them. And so what I'm going to name for you now are the charisms that are explored in the Called and Gifted workshop so that you can hear all of the varied and truly beautiful ways that one might respond to their giftedness in the Holy Spirit. So here are the charisms. Encouragement, hospitality, pastoring, mercy, helps, evangelism, teaching, Prophecy, giving, service, leadership, administration, healing, intercessory prayer, knowledge, discernment of spirits, wisdom, faith, voluntary poverty, missionary, celibacy, craftsmanship, music, and writing. at least 24 ways in which the Holy Spirit equips people to make of their lives a gift of their own superabundance of inner riches, to make of their lives something of a masterpiece for the good of others. This brings to mind, to me, a line from Pope Benedict XVI, who said, To me, art and the saints are the greatest apologetic for the faith. And here we also see that the saints and art, or artists, are not so far apart as we might first have thought. And I hope that the listing the charisms um, helps each of us to see how we might embrace that call to be an artist. So to continue now, I'd like to reverse the formulation and cover briefly how each artist is also called to be a saint. Today, in fact, quite helpfully, um, thank you to the reminder of a friend, is the Feast of Blessed Fra Angelico. He was a Dominican friar, known for his delicate paintings of holy images. Fra Angelico is not yet canonized a saint, but it's clear that he was A, an excellent painter, and B, a very holy man. And despite all the many artworks we have that survive of his, we have only one line to credit to his name. Fra Angelico said, to paint Christ, one must know Christ. 
This blessed man knew that his relationship was with God was foundational, was necessary, and was integral to his ability to paint. I turn us again to John Paul II's letter to artists. He takes up this very same line of thought. The distinction between the moral and artistic aspects is fundamental, but no less important is the connection between them. In producing a work, artists express themselves to the point where their work becomes a unique disclosure of their own being, of what they are, and of how they are what they are. In shaping a masterpiece, the artist not only summons his work into being, but in some way reveals his own personality by means of it. For him, art offers both a new dimension and an exceptional mode of expression for his spiritual growth. Works of art speak of their authors. They enable us to know their inner life, and they reveal the original contribution which artists offer to history and to culture. And this being the case, it's no surprise, actually, that when we approach works of art, we're able to say things like, this seems violent, or this feels peaceful, or I get the sense of despair from this, or I get a sense of hope, or I get a sense of joy. We can see those things revealed through the, through the work of art. And I think this also contributes to the fact that in a lot of artists, there's this kind of neurosis of like imposter syndrome, where it's like, am I, am I really good enough to be producing this thing? Am I really good enough to be sharing this? Am I kind of crazy? Because when you create this work of art, when you write this poem and you read it, when you put together this essay and publish it, part of you is being put out there. And perhaps someone with eyes keen enough to see it would be able to see something of the health or disposition of the artist's soul. I want to go back, too, to Jacques Maritain, from the same book I quoted earlier, who said, the whole soul of the artist affects and controls his work. Again, just supporting John Paul II. But the point is that the, the intimate relationship of the artist to their art goes so deep that the fruit of the artistic effort is connected to the artist's interior life. And again, that goes back to the definition at the beginning, the freely given superabundance of the human being's inner riches. Jacques Maritain also gave as advice to any aspiring Christian artist. If you want to produce Christian work, be a Christian and try to make a work of beauty into which you have put your own heart. It seems to me that he's right, and it seems to me also that it's as simple and as difficult as that. To conclude, I want to take us to the Gospels briefly. Jesus says in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. He also says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Indeed, we are the salt of the earth, we are the light of the world, but a light never lights itself, and salt never sprinkles itself, nor does a light give light to itself, nor does salt give flavor to itself. Through, and lives, through our lives and work, in cooperation with God's grace, we receive the gifts to become who we are, and we give those gifts away to help others do the same. 
Whether then we are speaking of Christians in general who are called to make of their lives a work of art, or of Christian artists in particular who are called to make of their life and their artwork a seamless garment, we can see that at the heart of it all is God's gift and God's gift of grace. To any extent that we Catholics will reclaim beauty, to any extent that we will reclaim art, will be directly in relation to the extent that we claim and reclaim time and again through success and failure, in grace and in forgiveness, our continual call to conversion and conformity to Christ. I thank you all for coming here tonight. It is good that we are here. And I ask you to go forth remembering that you are salt and that you are light and also recalling how precious is a candle in the darkness and how precious is salt in days of hunger. So with that, I thank you and turn you to your questions at your table. C.S. Lewis has this line. It goes something like, in art and literature, when people try to be original, they always fail. But if you simply tell the truth without caring what's been done before, nine times out of ten, you'll do something that's original. So similarly for us, if we sort of like, as we're creating something, if we're just like worried, like, is this thing going to be beautiful? Well, if I like put this thing here, then maybe it will strike people more. I think we can rely upon... um, our inner riches manifesting themselves as we produce something that's truthful. And I think probably nine times out of ten, you will produce something that's beautiful. And in terms of what other people do, I don't know. That's a... Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. So it sounds like from what you're saying that truth and goodness are in a slightly different category than beauty. Because it seems like truth is like... That's objectively like God is truth and God is goodness. But you're saying beauty is almost like a spectrum. There's like different qualities. Like you said, you more of like a battlefield. So it can be reflective of God. And then we're talking about like, there can be some beautiful knickknacks that are, you know, they're kind of objective. They're worldly beautiful. They don't really, you know, kind of, they're, they're just, they're beautiful. They're kind of neutral. And then there's beauty that it's like draws you into evil. And it just seems like you're saying beauty is in a much, is in a different category than truth and goodness. Is that, am I getting that right? Yeah, I think you're, I think you're onto something that per, but I, I would maybe put a finer point on it and say something like beauty perhaps of these things which are good is the most susceptible um, to being misused. Um, so I was talking to a few tables, and you know, one of the things the catechism says about sin is that you know, it's an act that wounds our relationship with God and with others due to an inordinate attachment to a good. So oftentimes when we sin, very rarely are we saying, like, I'm, j- I'm just going to commit a sin. We're sort of like choosing a good thing. Like, I see that, th- that thing over there, and I really want it, and so I'm going to steal it. Or I see this apple in the garden, it's really beautiful, but it's not for me, but I'm still going to take it. Um, so I think that there are ways that um, those things which are good can be, or, or true, can be misused. I just think beauty is more susceptible to them. Um, I, I will say the, the catechism also mentions, I'll just read this part for you and you can do with it what you will. Truth is beautiful in itself. Truth in words, the rational expression of the knowledge of created and uncreated reality, is necessary to man who is endowed with intellect. But truth can also find other complementary forms of human expression, above all when it is a matter of evoking what is beyond words, the depths of the human heart, the exaltations of the soul, the mystery of God. And so those things just named for truth, those expressions of truth, those are times when beauty actually is able to like serve and unite truth because you know, we can't just link it up with a word. Um, and then one final thought I had on it. Um, they are all sort of in the same category as transcendentals. Um, I think Thomas has five 
truth, goodness, beauty, but also reality and unity. Um, so they're sort of in this transcendental category because they can't be put in a category or box because they, they sort of exist in, um, in all of them. And then another thing I read um, from an Orthodox theologian, he described beauty as sort of like the halo that unites truth and goodness. It's a poetic image. The, the Notre Dame Cathedral was mentioned, um, and I don't know, people might know about the um, recent, what, what was it? There is a decree on architecture of some sort in, here in the US. Um, they're trying to um, decide um, how government buildings should be designed, if there should be some sort of, um, if there should be one way in which they should be done. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you believe there's sort of a fragmentation in um, Western culture's conception of beauty, and if there's something that can be done to um, to improve that in education, would it be education? Do we need to better educate people about beauty? Um, or is this a spiritual problem? And um, as we turn back to God, then um, we will turn back to a more unified vision of what is beautiful. Thanks, Jerome, for the question. I don't know what something like an educational program um, would do to change society's conception of things. I would probably say that in a lot of ways, the way we treat materials and even ourselves is very technologized. And because of that is treated in a utilitarian way. So when you speak of something like architecture, um, especially in a time of appropriately, at a time that is appropriately concerned with the right use of resources, that I think most people would actually say, hey, if we can make it beautiful, awesome, but what we're really concerned about is getting like LEED certified so that we're a platinum building or something like this and using as least amount of energy po as possible. And actually, we don't want load-bearing walls because we want this to be a flexible space and we need it to be adaptable. But also, if we knock it down, we want that to be an option if this space changes. So I think there are a lot of utilitarian um, ideas and concepts that are just given so much more weight than beauty in something like architecture that I don't know how much of a consideration it is. Cool. Do you want to talk about um, beauty within the context of the mass at all? Mm. <laughs> Maybe. Mm. Should, should I ask a specific question? Go for it. No, I'm just thinking about it because it is a great question. It's kind of open ended. There, you yeah, can do whatever there, you want. It's great, you know? Man. There's just no boundaries, there's no form you have to work within, you know? Whatever artistic style you want to answer the question in. I would, that would actually be a relief to me at this moment. <laughs> um, Jerome, that is an excellent question. And the only thing that comes to mind is thinking about um, the incarnation and the gift of the Eucharist and um, what that means for us as, what, what that gift is for us. Um, but I don't have anything else to say that would be worthwhile at this moment. Well, that's okay. I mean, the the church itself um, talks about, I think, exactly what you did. That if Christ is central, um, then then that's that's what's important. That is the the beauty, whatever beauty exists in the architecture, art, or music, a mass is supposed to reveal the face of Christ, who comes to us in the Eucharist. So, mm. is it, yeah. So I got right like on. a B on the question. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa? I actually have a really oh. interesting thought and reaction. Uh, wait oh, for a microphone. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, um, so I just have a thought kind of in reaction to that. Uh, like if you think about the Mass and the Eucharist and preparing yourself for it, um, there's this idea of, like technically the, the part you need to show up for is the consecration. Um, like that's, that's the thing that fulfills your obligation. But, uh, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, but... From what I remember from learning, that is, that is the thing you have to show up for. Uh, but you get more out of 
the mass, out of the interaction, out of that encounter with Christ, if you are receptive and you prepare yourself for that moment. Um, so like the more time you invest, the more you get out of the sacrament. Um, and that kind of, to me, reminds me of that idea of a uh, charisma is, uh, like, and beauty are things that are freely given out of an overabundance. And that's what we get, um, like, you can think of the Eucharist and the Mass in those terms, but there has to be another person on the other side of the beauty who is uh, receptive to receiving it. So if, like, someone gives this free gift of a painting or a song or a book or, uh, like, compassionate interaction with a person, um, they can give that, but a gift is a gift. It doesn't have to be received, whereas we need to like allow ourselves to be receptive and to pre prepare ourselves for that and be open to it so that we can receive the gift and engage in that genuine interaction. Yeah, Lisa, thank you for that contribution. Um, and it actually maybe makes me think of a possible answer to, to what Jerome brought up, which was, yeah, one, one should be disposed um, to receive the sacraments. And so maybe that is one of the roles in the Mass for beauty, um, for music, for architecture, is to dispose us to receive the graces that are available through the sacraments. So thank you. Thank you. Um, you made me think of something I saw in one of my meme groups. I'm in a meme group that shames modern architecture, um, and it's hilarious, but one of the serious comments was a quote, if we want something to endure, we strive for beauty, not efficiency. Um, and so when you're talking about modern architecture and the need to break things down and be flexible and be changing. Um, the, you know, the idea of something being, you know, static um, and, you know, more permanent, um, I think is why, um, you know, why the, we're having this discussion about classical versus modern architecture for government buildings. Um, so I think that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, for, for, so from an engineering perspective, um, like there could be a criteria, there could be like an idea of beauty from the efficiency of it. I don't, I don't know if that supports or, or hurts what you're talking about. But, um, not necessarily mutually exclusive, but I don't know. You don't like that? <laughs> yeah, engineers usually do and other people don't. <laughs> to be fair, I do think there is something to be said for sort of this like intellectual beauty that people, people can be changed by beauty and um, enter into faith in the church having read the Catechism or having read Newman or something like that. So there is like that beauty that exists um, through seeing someone's knowledge and intellect, this practical art coming to fruition. Um, I don't know that it's, it's we're, I think maybe we're talking about apples and oranges, but I, it is, I think, an element of, there is something beautiful there to be appreciated. Hey, thank you, Stephen, for talking to us tonight. We had a discussion at our table on uh, charisms versus talents. Mm. So charisms being coming from the Holy Spirit and building up the church, whereas talents are not necessarily doing that, but there still a, can be a significant overlap between the two. Uh, would you be able to expand on that, Annie? You know, honestly, the person you're handing the microphone to would probably be the one best equipped <laughs> to explain that. Yeah, I think, you're, I think you're totally on point, that the charisms are a gift from the Holy Spirit, um, that they are meant to be given to others, whereas talents you know, are, are, are natural gifts. They're things that certainly can be done in the service of other people. Um, but yeah, I guess they're not inspired in the same way. Um, perhaps they manifest themselves in different ways, but certainly, too, there is that overlap that you mentioned where, um, yeah, I would expect that someone who has the charism of music to be talented in that way um, enough so that this could manifest. Um, I don't know if there are other people with more to say that they could add, but. All right. <laughs>